Hello everyone, welcome to today's quick learn series on Excel advanced formulas and operations. My name is Susie Johannes. I'm a technology instructor. I've met many of you in our classes. Today um, we have with us Michelle Brewer who is going to be helping with the webinar and help us with the chat and questions. Just to talk a little bit about the course format, the Quick Learn series is a series of webinars where we face uh, or where we focus on one topic at a time. Um, we have three more left in the uh, in the fall session, and I'll show you what those are in a little bit. Um, with things that come up today, I'm going to be showing a presentation. It won't be hands-on. I'll be more demonstrating or giving you a little bit of an intro to the topics we cover. After the session is over, I'll include a follow-up email with a session recording. So you may have noticed that we are recording this session. If you um, uh, if you want to refer to it again, I'll, we'll have it on our Quick Learn webpage. And so in the follow-up email, I'll send you a link to that webpage. Um, like I mentioned, Michelle is helping with questions, and so if you do have questions as they come up, um, please submit them through the chat, and we'll take breaks throughout to address them. So the upcoming quick learns that we have next, um, in a couple weeks we have an overview of the different survey, poll, and form tools available at KU. A couple weeks after that, we're doing PowerPoint tips and tricks, and then finally, um, in December, we're going to do um, some Photoshop basics that is geared more towards uh, work for web. If this is one of your first times joining a Skype for Business meeting, a couple tips. You may want to maximize your window so that my screen is as large as possible on your screen. Um, by default, everyone should come in and be muted. Um, for the most part, we're going to ask that people uh, continue to be muted. Um, you can see that you're muted because you'll have a slash through your microphone. Um, so instead of asking questions in real time, we're asking that you click the message and also provide some, you know, provide your uh, question through the chat. Um, when you hit enter, that chat message is sent. So then we'll take a break and answer them periodically. We're going to cover a lot today. We're going to cover a lot of, um, of these advanced formulas and operations. First, we have to do a little bit of review. I want to cover some tips and tricks for data selection, autofill, flash fill, um, just that we'll be using as we go so you kind of know what I'm doing when I'm doing that. Um, we're going to get into conditional statements. We'll talk about if-then statements. Um, we'll talk about options for nesting if-then statements, how to um, kind of change those if-then statements slightly to have multiple conditions that either need to be met, don't need to be met, or an either-or scenario. We'll talk about some other um, functions that are grouped under the category of statistical functions that are kind of like an if-then statement but can actually summarize um, data by summing values, counting values, or averaging values. Um, as we go, we'll look at the if NA and if error functions that can be helpful in cleaning up your workbooks. Um, then we're going to move on to lookup statements. We are going to cover VLOOKUP, HLOOKUP, and just a regular lookup. And then um, finally, we'll look at an alternative to the lookup statement, which is index and match. So hopefully we'll get to everything here. Um, I do want to point out that if you are looking for that hands-on experience, we have an Excel advanced course that covers um, and has uh, hands-on activities for most of the things we're covering here today. Um, a few things before we get started. We're going to be talking about Excel today. So before I talk about Excel, I need to make sure everyone knows that students, faculty, and staff can download and install the latest version of Office on up to five personal machines through our KU negotiated licensing. Um, I'll include these instructions in the follow-up. Uh, I'll include the PowerPoint slides as well. But the main thing is to get to those downloads, you usually you'll log in to mycommunity.ku.edu and click on the Office 365 link. That same licensing that allows us to download the desktop version of Office, it also allows us to use the Microsoft mobile apps. Um, there's a little bit of a trick to signing into those mobile apps, but you can use the full functionality of those. Um, and then using My Community, it, by signing in there and going to your OneDrive, you can actually create documents, create uh, Excel spreadsheets or workbooks all from the browser. So that's all grouped under Office 365. So uh, 
just a little bit of review of uh, what are functions versus formulas. Like it says here, functions are pre-programmed operations. So you might be familiar with some common ones like sum, average, that type of thing. Whenever we're doing either a function or a formula, it always starts with the equal sign. That's how Excel knows that we're about to do a calculation. Um, once we, in the case of the function, once we specify the function's name, then in the parentheses, that's where we list what are called arguments. The arguments can include actual, um, okay, sorry, one second. Okay, thank you for letting me know about the audio. Um, I'll see what I can do and I'll try to speak just a little bit slower so that um, maybe it will come through a little bit clearer. Okay, um, in these examples of functions, we have the equal sign sum and here you can see we can hard code in actual numbers. So we could say sum the value and this is actually the number one. Um, separated by comma, in this case, two and three. We also, in the next one, see that we can use functions and reference cells. So this is this next one example is referencing a series of cells from A2 down through A15. Um, maybe um, include the note to have them leave and rejoin again or or include that conference number. Okay, sorry everybody, we're just making sure everyone can hear the audio um, and get to the meeting space. I'll keep going and um, hopefully those who can't hear up to this point, they'll be able to check the recording to see that extra information. So when we're talking about these pre-programmed operations, those are called functions. When we actually do the math, um, almost like you would write out the mathematical equation, that's technically called a formula. So similar to how you can write out a formula, you can do that same kind of thing within Excel. Again, it always starts with the equal sign. You can include references to cells. You can hard code in um, numbers. Um, here with this example, we have equal sign one plus two plus three. We could also be um, referencing cells that have these values using the plus sign, minus sign, the asterisk for multiplication, or um, the forward slash for uh, division. There is an order of operations to be aware of. Um, with the order of operations, usually if I'm getting this complex, I usually have to look it up. There is a mnemonic device, um, but it kind of works similar to how, you know, we were taught of order of operations in math. So if you can think about that, that will help you out. Otherwise, you can always search for this and find out the Excel order of operations. All right, I'm going to talk about a few tips and tricks, and then we'll get into those if-then statements. So let me move to my first example here. And it's going to be this one. Okay. So I want to talk about a few selection tools or tips and tricks that you have here. Um, you know, if you're working with a really large uh, data set, um, sometimes it can be hard when we are working with formulas or you're working with functions to make different selections. Um, I first want to just talk about kind of jumping around your worksheet. A great tip or trick I always like to share is the control plus the arrow keys. When you do this, you jump to the edges of your data so long that your data is continuous and doesn't have any completely empty columns or rows. So in this case, if I do a control, control arrow right, I jump to the very left column. If I can do a, a control arrow down, I jump now down to the last row. I can do that, follow it all the way around. If I want to select as I go, I can add a shift to that. So now if I do a control shift arrow over, it's going to select everything um, up until that first empty column. If I keep holding down control shift arrow down, it's going to select everything down to the first empty row. So that can be a helpful way to make selections, especially when your data is all, con um, 
you know, continuous and you don't have any empty rows uh, or columns. Um, if I want to return back to that cell A1, I can do a control home key. That always takes me back to cell A1. To some extent, control A will work. So here, if I'm already clicked somewhere in this data and I do a control A, it's going to select everything in this continuous data. If I can select control A again, it selects every cell on this entire worksheet. Another way to select every cell in the entire worksheet, oops. Um, another way to do that exact same thing is to click in the upper left hand corner of your worksheet that will select um, the entire worksheet. Um, just a small note I always like to share, you may be familiar about um, you know, resizing your columns automatically by double clicking between the column headings. Um, that little trick of, of double clicking between the column headings automatically resizes your column to the largest entry. If you want to do this for the entire worksheet, you can select in that upper left hand corner and then do that double click uh, to one of your columns and it will automatically resize everything at once. So that can be a good time saver, especially if you are just kind of learning what is a part of this worksheet and, and wanting to see the entire columns and column names. Okay. Um, moving to a couple more uh, tips or tricks, let's talk a little bit about autofill and flash fill. So here, let's see, I have an example. to show you and let me come here all right so here in this employee contact we're not going to cover text uh, functions in all, uh, much detail but there is different text functions for joining different text strings so here there's one called concatenate which I usually can't spell so I just type in equals con when I see it from the list I can choose it by clicking the tab key and now I get this great text uh, tip to tell me what I need to do next so here to join different strings I just need to select the strings or the cells that have the strings and then separate them like it shows here with a comma so the first one in this case is going to be first name. I'll do a comma space and then the cell with the last name. Now I can just hit enter and I have that um, joined. Now in this case, if I actually wanted a space between the two, I would have to include that as its own text string using a comma between my two other text strings. And the way that I do a space is by doing quote space quote. So that means the character of space. So here, if I do that, then I have that joined together. Now, you may be familiar with this, but you can autofill these uh, different, you know, as long as you have your formulary function in the first cell, you can autofill by hovering in the bottom right hand corner and then by um, clicking and dragging down. That works a lot of times. However, if you're uh, if your data set's really long, sometimes you're dragging for a really long time. So a great tip or trick I picked up from someone in one of our classes is that when you see that autofill handle, that little black plus sign, you can double click and it will just automatically fill down to your first empty row. Another way to join text strings is more to use a formula, and this uses the ampersands as the thing to join. So here, if we want last name, we start with an equal sign always. We say equals the cell with the last name, ampersand. Now here, we want a comma space between, so we have to put that in quotes. That's how we do that text string. We do another ampersand and now first name for this option. So here we have that text string joined together. We can fill down to get everything else. Now, if you are a PC user and if you um, are kind of interested or you do a lot of this, you can use something called flash fill. Unfortunately, flash fill is not available in the Mac versions. How flash fill works is you start to just enter in the um, how you want your text to appear. 
And so I start with the first one here, James Smith. As I start typing in the second one, Excel automatically guesses the pattern that I'm using. And as long as it looks you know, pretty much correct, I can just hit enter and it's gonna fill in that series. Now, if I were to keep uh, typing, I would lose that option to flash fill. So let me show you how you can get around that. Um, you have a couple options. So if I keep typing in the series here and I keep typing, I'll eventually lose the option. So uh, you can do a few things. You can select the series that you've started and use the autofill handle to fill down. It's going to copy those cells, but once you use the autofill handle, you get these autofill options. Now you can choose flash fill and it's going to fill that in. Um, there's also keyboard shortcuts for these things. So here, flash fill, if you select the first cell that has the pattern in it and then all the other cells you want to flash fill, you can do a control E. That's going to fill that. If you're just looking to do a normal autofill, you can choose the first cell that has the function or the formula. You can select all your other cells and then do a control, oh, sorry. You can do a control D and mine's not gonna work for me, but um, that should autofill down that function. So there we go with that one. So just a few couple uh, tips or tricks as we go, we'll be using a lot of these. Um, we'll also be talking about relative and absolute references soon. Um, we'll talk about some shortcuts with that. Um, so I just want to move back here. Um, if you could, uh, I'm going to keep moving on, but if you do have a favorite tip or trick or a keyboard shortcut, um, I'm going to ask you to go ahead and uh, instant message that to us in the um, conversation we have here in the meeting. Um, we usually pick up a lot of tips from people who are actually in the workshop, so let us know what your favorite tip or trick is. Okay, so we're going to move on to logical functions, and for the most part, we're going to start with the most basic type of logical function, which is the if-then statement. You can add other qualifiers to this, so you can add um, and, or, or not. Um, we'll also talk about if error, if NA, those can be used to kind of clean up your worksheet so that you don't see error or NA answers. With these, for the most part, we test whether a statement is true or false. And you can do things in here to test whether multiple straight, uh, statements are true or false. And you can use these, like it says here, for numbers, currencies, dates, and text. Um, so just to start off with the most basic if-then statement, this has three different values and they're separated by commas. So we start with the function, which is equal if. It starts with a parentheses for our arguments. The first argument is our logical test. So this is gonna be a statement such as if this equals that or if this is greater than that. And, and those values can be uh, actually hard coded into or entered in or they can be referencing cells. Um, we do a comma, then we do the value we want to be if it's true. This can just be a, a singular value or it could be another formula or function. Um, and then we say the value we want to show if it's false. So here's just an example. We start with the equals if function. Um, then we have our parentheses and here we have our logical test or our statement. In this case, it's saying if the value in D2 is greater than 500. We start with a comma. The next thing that we're showing is what we want it to show if it's true. In this case, we want to show a value of 20. If it's false, that's the last thing separated by comma. We want to show a value of 40. There's different uh, operators you can use in these if-then statements. So a lot of this is going to be kind of, you know, what we learned in math class. Equal sign, if we want to say, you know, these values need to be equal. Not equal, a little bit lesser, you know, intuitive, is the lesser than, greater than sign. Greater than, less than. If we want to do greater than or less than to, um, or less than or equal to, we start off by using either the greater than or less than symbol and then the equal sign. So let's take a look at this and actually see it in practice. Here I just have a worksheet set up and it has just some sample 
made up data of different orders. Each order has a region, it has a sales rep, it has an item, the number of units sold, the cost per unit, and then finally the total. So in these different scenarios here, we're going to be talking about different discounts, and we're going to say that in um, these different cases, what they need to do to qualify for that discount. So starting off with this first one, here it says where purchases are more than $500, they get a 10% discount. So that's going to mean if the total is more than $500, they get a 10% discount. So we're going to use our if-then statement. We're going to say equals if. Here when I see that option presented, I do a tab to select it. Um, you could just, just um, also type their left parentheses to start. Here is our equation or our logical statement that we need to prove true or false. So in this case, it's going to be that the total is greater than 500. So we say, uh, and this looks a little bit different because this is formatted as a table, but it's basically saying if that value is greater than 500, that's our statement. Now we do a comma space. The value if true, here we want to take the total and we want to take it times 90% because it's a 10% discount. So we do the asterisk, which is the multiplication, and then we do a 0.9 for 90%. And we do a comma space. Now the value of false is actually optional, so I could just end this here and not even include a value for false. If I want it to appear just empty, um, the trick there is just two sets of quotes. That means show nothing. So now I can hit uh, return. This one doesn't qualify. It's not over 500. If I autofill down, I will start to see those appear here. So I see those orders that are over $500. They're the only ones that appear to have a discount. Um, so we can do the same kind of logical statement using text. So in this example, we're running a promotion in the east region. So it says here, if the region is east, then they get a 20% discount on their total. So we start again with equals if. I do a tab. The value that has that you know, criteria in it is over here. So if this cell is equal to, and because we're using text, we need to put it in quotes. So if the value in the cell is equal to east, comma, space, here's the value we want to have if it's true. We're going to take the total. We're going to multiply it by 0.8, so 80%. If not, we're going to do quote, quote, so that it shows nothing. So with that, this first one is in the east region, so that's working. I can fill down, and I can see everything that's in the east region should have a value by it. Here we have just another example of the same kind of basic if-then statement. This one is a greater than or equal to. So we say orders with more or equal to 50 units, they'll get a 5% discount. So here we say equals if tab. So we're saying units. So that's the cell we're going to use in our statement. So if this cell is greater than or equal to 50, then we are going to take the total, we're going to multiply it by 0.95 or 95%. If not, this is the value we want to false, we're going to say nothing again. So those three things, um, the logical statement, the value of true, and then the value of false. Here I can fill this down and I can get all of um, those larger uh, orders with greater than or equal to 50. Um, okay, so I want to talk now about some variations on this. And so let me go back to my slide. If you have multiple uh, statements that you need to prove either true, or in some case, either one or the other needs to be true, or if they need to not be true, um, you can use these extra things such as and, or, or not with your if-then statement. Um, so like it says here, um, and is going to show you um, that it's and is going to say both need to be true. 
or is going to say either one or the other needs to be true and then not like it says here reverses the logic so if any of those prove true then um, it's it's going to kind of reverse the logic of your statement so here let me see um, we have an example of it here uh, of an or and an and so in this case we want to say purchases that are either more than five hundred dollars or more than 75 items get a five percent discount so all this stuff is made up um, but here if, if we're going to use something like this where either one needs to be true we start with an equals and do if so we say equals if now here for our logical test here's where we include the word or so i type in or i do a tab and that gets me to my next tool tip. So here it's saying my logical statements, I need to show those and I need to separate them with commas. So the first one is the purchase is more than $500. So that's gonna be the total for this row is greater than 500. I'll do a comma space. Now I'm on to my second logical statement, which is that there is more than 75 items. So here, that's my units is greater than 75. Now to end this, I have to click the right parentheses to end that. And I see in the tool tip that I've just concluded that logical test segment. So now I can do a comma space. The value of true is gonna be the total times 95%. The value of false will just do nothing again. So here, this should have the most items in my list and so we're seeing a lot of the same things here are showing up now in this case a special discount in the east region for this example the purchase has to be more than five hundred dollars and it has to be in the east region so here's where we start with an equals if here because we need both to be true we say and and i just do a tab um, now our logical statements separated by commas. So we need this cell to equal the word east. We need the total to be greater than 500. We just close the parentheses for that. And now we're on to the value of true. So the value of true, this gets multiplied by 85% for that 15% discount. If false, we'll just say nothing and we will fill that down. So here we see the most limited amount of things get that, um, get that kind of discount in this scenario. Um, there's even more variations on these and when we get to these other variations that I'm gonna point out, they're technically referred to as statistical functions. So if you wanna go beyond just testing a statement and showing a value, here you can use these different functions such as sum if, average if, count if to actually sum the values if um, the value in a certain cell matches a criteria. So you can sum, you can average, you can count the, the number of rows. Um, there's also the same kind of functions that will let you have multiple criteria and those are called sum ifs, average ifs, count ifs. I believe with Excel 2016, there's even a new if then formula called ifs, which will allow you to do that, that kind of thing we were doing with the if and. Um, but here, let me show you some examples of these. So we'll go back. I'm going to hide these because we don't need them anymore. And let me delete this. So here we want to find total sales information by region. So we want to find the total sales of all the sales in the East region. So we need to be able to just choose the rows that have East here in the region field. So the function for this is called equals sum if. And this is a little bit different than what we've been doing. So there's three different terms that we have to choose. The first says range. That's gonna be the range that has the criteria in it. So in this case, it's gonna be our, our range of cells that have all of our different region names. The second thing is gonna be the actual criteria. So we'll be able to actually put in the text in quotes, east 
or if we have a cell that refers to that, we could use the cell reference. Finally, like it says here, the range that has the values that we want to sum. So in this case, we're going to start with that first range, which is our region. And I just select those. I'll do a comma space. Now I'll do it two ways here. I know it needs to be east, so I'm just going to put east in quotes as my criteria. Um, again, all these are commas. I do a comma space. I don't think the space matters. Um, now I'm going to do the sum range. I'm just going to choose those values there that have the totals because I want the total sales. Now when I hit enter, it just gives me the value of the total sales in the east region. If I want the number of sales, that's a good option to use count if. Count if is just going to count the number of rows and it's set up even a little bit different than sum if. So I say equals count if tab. I just have two things to specify. The first is the range and the second is the criteria. So we're just looking for the rows that have east in it because that will uh, mean the number of sales. So here I just choose that that um, selection that has those uh, region names and I can just type east in quotes and then I should see uh, 11, perfect. Um, if I want to average the total, that's a different one, which is an average if. It's set up pretty similar than the other ones. Average if, I can do the range first, and so it's very similar to the sum if. The range is going to be my range with the criteria. The, the criteria is going to be the criteria I'm looking for. In this case, I have the word east in the cell over here, so I can just choose the cell that has the word east rather than typing it in quotes. And then finally, the range to average, I'm going to choose here that total range. So that's just going to give me the average for each sale in the east. And so I could do this across and fill in all the other ones. Um, in this case, I just, I'll just go through one of these. But if I want multiple things to have to be true, I can use some ifs, count ifs, average ifs. So here it's set up a little bit differently. In this case, I want sales in the Midwest by the salesperson Smith. So here I say equals some ifs. It's got the S on the end. So this is a little bit backwards from the actual sum if. The first thing you specify is the sum range. So that's going to be our totals. And here you just start to designate the range with the criteria and then the criteria. And then you do a comma space and go right into the next criteria range and criteria. So you can do almost unlimited amounts of these. Here we're going to say the region has to be Midwest. And then here we have the rep has to be Smith. So then we just get Smith in the Midwest. And so if we remember 7548, we can actually kind of filter down and just check our work here. Um, and so we can say that down here in the corner. Uh, let's see, or I can say because this is a table, I can say give me a total row um, in the table tools and I can see that was the exact same value. Okay, um, just building on this um, for one more example, a lot of times when you're doing these things, you can use them on text values. So luckily in the example we had all of our text values such as East, West, Midwest, that type of thing, they were um, all kind of uh, consistent. Sometimes when you get different characters or different entries, they're not so much. And so that's when wildcard characters can really come into hand. Um, we'll see this in the next example where we have some fruit, but one wildcard character is the asterisk. So here in this example, like it says, um, for this example, if we were to type this into our, our um, logical statement, it would include everything that just begins with W-E-R. If we need entries that end with W-E-R, we have that as the second sample there. We also have examples where W-E-R just needs to be contained somewhere there. And then the question mark also works as a wildcard character. So let me go here to this example. 
Here in this example, I'm not going to fill out all of these, but I want to show you this one. We just have the different maybe orders and they're repeated here. So there's there's two different orders for apples. Um, and, and there's two different types of apples. One apple is green apples and the other ones are red apples. So in this case, if we want to sum all apples, um, to catch all of those, that's where we could use one of those wildcard characters. So here, here I'm going to say equals and then sum if because that's our, you know, that's our statement for summing. So we'll say equals sum if. Here's the range. So we're going to choose those different types. We're going to do a comma space. For the criteria, since we're working with text, we need to use the quotes. And because we want to keep catch all types of apples, we can just do an asterisk and then apples. Finally, the sum range. So here, and then we hit enter, we get 804. So we can kind of test this here. And there we go. In the corner, let's see, you probably can't see this because the screen is smaller. Here in the corner, I get those summary statistics, and that's just confirming that that sum is 800. Oh, let me pull this up. Um, I don't know if you've ever noticed those, but those summary statistics right here is showing me the sum of those cells that I selected is 804. So um, wildcard characters can be really great, especially if you have some inconsistency in your data um, or that type of thing. Um, I wanted to bring up one more thing that I saw in a different work uh, book that I hadn't been aware of, and that's this dsum formula or function. Um, I'm not going to go into this, but um, it can be a really great way just to create a little tool for yourself on how to or to sum different fields based on different criteria. So in the example I have set up, I'll just show you how it works. Once you set it up, I have my dsum here. Um, and actually, let me go to completed. Okay, so with dsum, you're able to say this is my database, this is the field that I want to sum, and then this is the criteria. And you have to choose the headings when you're making these um, specifications. But then what you're able to do is just kind of type in whichever criteria you want, and it can be multiple. You're able just to quickly see for all the freshman female, this is the total scholarships awarded. So um, you can do this in a bunch of other ways. I mean, we could do this with some ifs and different things like that. But this is kind of a nice way if you want to create a little tool like this for yourself to see these summary st statistics on how to do that. Okay. So we want to get into lookup functions. Lookup functions are pretty exciting, especially if you're using fiscal data. Um, with lookup functions, what you can use them to do is to, like it says here, scan a column in the case of VLOOKUP, a row in the case of HLOOKUP, or an, an array to find um, another value. So sometimes in inventory sheets, you may know um, one number that's used by one system, but you want to return the number used by another system, or you want to return the cost of that item. You can use all these things for um, using a VLOOKUP to, to look up that value. Um, as we go, I'll talk more about this. When we're talking about VLOOKUP, um, we'll be talking about the value you know versus the value you're searching for. With VLOOKUP, they can only look to the right, so the value you know must be in the left column. So in cases where you're looking up by employee ID, student ID, that value should always be in the leftmost column. Um, Lookup information needs to be arranged vertically because it's going to look vertically first and then look horizontally. And um, the other thing with VLOOKUP and with HLOOKUP, they only return the first value. So it won't go beyond whatever the first value is. If you have duplicates in your data, it won't show you the duplicate value. It'll only show you the first value. 
So we'll look at this in practice here with VLOOKUP. We say equals VLOOKUP. There's four different things here. We, we separate them by commas. The first one is the lookup value. That's the value you know. So it could be the employee ID. It could be the product number. It could be whatever um, SKU or internal tracking number you're using. The second thing is the table array. So this is in the table of the values you're looking. So it could be your inventory sheet. It could be your employee roster. It could be anything like that. So you'll specify that entire table. The third thing that we'll put is the column index number. So we'll actually start counting the columns starting from the leftmost one that has our lookup value. And we'll put a number that corresponds with the, the number of that column from the left. And then the last one, this is probably the least intuitive thing, I think, true or false. Um, generally, true is approximate, false is exact. Everything that we're going to be doing today is going to be using false. So let's take a look at this in practice. Here, I'm just going to start off really basic with just a small table here and show you some VLOOKUP op options. So the first one, find the color of apple. So in this case, the thing we know is the word apple. We're going to be looking up here in this table. We want to return the color. So in this cell here, I can say equals VLOOKUP. And I do a tab once I see that, that option selected. The first thing is the lookup value, which is the value we know. So here we say apple. We do a comma space. The next thing is the table array where we're looking. So here I'll just start with Apple. I can select that whole thing. I'll do a comma space. The second, or sorry, this third term is the column index number. So we start counting with the column with the lookup value. So this is one and this is two. And that's the column we're returning. So the second column or column two. This last one is that true or false. Remember, we're going to be using false today because that's the exact match. So we'll just do that and we return the value of green. So no big deal in this you know, example because this is a really small little set. But if you had more, this could be more valuable. Here we'll just do one, um, another one, VLOOKUP, tab. I'm going to say first the value I know. Instead of using banana in quotes, I'm just going to refer to that cell because I have it right here. I'm going to do a comma space. Now the table array. So I'll choose, you know, starting with the column I know. I'll go across. I, I don't have to select this, but I I'm just doing it anyway. I'll, I'll do a comma space. Now the index number, again, that's here's column one. Here's column two. That's what we want to return. So we put a two there and then uh, false. We want that uh, exact match. So here we have yellow. Um, I'll just jump to this last one. More likely, find the price of a product using a cell reference. So here we know the product number. We just want to return the price. Here we can say equals VLOOKUP. Um, the value we know, we could, we could enter it, but we'll just use that cell. We'll do a comma space, the table array. So I'm just going to select everything here. The column index number. So again, we count from the value we know. One, two, three, four. That's our fourth column. And finally, we're going to use a false because we want to leave that as an exact match. So here we should see Kiwi is 20 cents. Perfect. So the cool thing about this is you could create yourself, you know, you can make a little tool for yourself where you can come in here and you could just change this number. So maybe I want to look up product number one now. Um, whenever I change that number, this is all dynamic. So that's just going to change to be uh, show me exactly what that value is. So we used VLOOKUP because we wanted to scan first. Oh, yeah, we have a great question there. If the data is 001, or sorry, 004, um, that's a good question. Uh, in this case, instead of using that uh, trick or that workaround, we formatted this as text. Um, I'll have to double check, but I think it should all work out the same. 
So I'll have to check to make sure. Um, but I will find out for sure if there's any tips or tricks for that. Um, VLOOKUP, so here we looked up, we looked down this column vertically first to return the values over here. And less likely to happen is HLOOKUP. This sp scans first horizontally and then looks vertically. So here, Anna's final exam score, it's pretty similar to VLOOKUP, only we say equals HLOOKUP tab. The value we know, so that's going to be Anna. We'll do a comma space, the table array, so we'll choose this whole table, the comma space, row index, so now we're counting rows. We start with the first one with the value we know, one, two, three, four, five, so that's the final exam. And finally, we're going to do a false for the exact match. So here it should be, yep, Anna got a 99% on that final exam. Um, we could do the same thing with Matt, only we could use the cell reference instead of how we did with Anna when we actually put her name in quotes. Um, one thing that will come up a lot when we're using VLOOKUP, and especially if, you're auto -fill if you autofill down or anything like that, is this intuitive way that Excel autofills your functions and your formulas. So you've probably seen this, but when you autofill down by default, Excel will move all of your references to be relative to the position of the cell where it's being copied. So as we're moving down, it's going to move down in your references, or as we're moving to the right, all of your references move to the right. Those are called relative references. In the case of lookup, a lot of times, or VLOOKUP or HLOOKUP, a lot of times we don't want that to move with us because we're always referring to the same table. So your inventory you know, range of data is always going to be the same or something like that. In that case, in that formula or in that uh, function, we'll want to use something called an absolute reference. You can see an absolute reference um, has, you know, is absolute because has dollar signs between before the A, or sorry, the column letter or the row number. Um, there's also mixed references that allow you to change rows but not change columns and vice versa. Um, there's a keyboard tip or trick here as you're entering your function or your formula when you're entering the cell references if you click on the F4 key that will make your references absolute you can actually kind of toggle through using the F4 and it will change it to be all of these different types of references um, some way to get around this type of absolute reference if you format your data as a table so you might be familiar with that, but you, you can select the data and do a control T to make it a table. Um, that will always be absolute. Or if you're familiar with range, uh, named ranges, which we'll see in a later example, that will always be absolute. I keep saying a later example, but we're running out of time, so we'll get to it. Um, I wanted to show you this option that is a, um, an option that could be maybe something, an alternative to VLOOKUP. And that's a combination of using index and match. And actually, Jessica, who asked the question, she's the one I first learned about this from. So what, with index, what you can do is you can say, um, you know, from this table array, which is the first thing you, you say in your function, show me the value that's in this row number and this row column number. So it's almost like you have a coordinate. And so you know the rows number, you know the columns number, so you're asking it to show you the value in that table in that row and column. How you get that row and column is most likely by using two different match functions. So match allows you in a table to say, this is the value I know, these are the cells I'm searching, um, and this is the match type that I want. Um, and then it will, and then basically you can say, um, you know, show me the row number, show me the column number. So um, I just kind of use this or set this up with fake data. 
I probably don't have a whole lot of time to go through it in detail, but I'll include this example in the follow-up so you can use it and you can change it if you want. Um, so what I have here, there's two things. One, there's a little rate sheet. Um, so we have internal rates and external rates, and then we have different services. So in our invoice sheet, we wanted to show specific rates, but it's based on two things. It's based on the client type and then on the service. So basically, there's a few things set up here. You don't have to do this, but right here in this field, this is using data validation. So in this case with data validation, you're able to say only let the person choose between the items presented in this list. You find that data validation option here under data. There's a data validation option. So this is set up to be the option of either internal or in, uh, external. This is set up to also have data validation to only show the services that are listed here. It's only showing these options listed here under services. So um, here for the row match, that's just using that match statement. Um, and it's basically saying um, use the value here. Um, and then it's saying go to the rate sheet here. And in this series, tell me you know which row it is that that value appears. So let's see, in this case, consultation, it should appear here as the first row. Um, a similar thing is happening with column, only it's saying match this type. So it's saying match the client type and tell me which column it is. Um, so here there'd be column one and column two. So here column two is what should show for external and that's what shows. Finally, bringing this all together is this index. So it's saying from the rates worksheet, show me what's in and there's spe uh, specific cells that are chosen here. It's saying show what's in row one, column two. So that's a little bit more advanced index match, um, but I'll include this if you want to try it out. There's the completed for you to check, and then there's also an invoice without any of that filled in. Um, the thing that I've also done here, which uh, is can be a helpful way to do things is I've created a named range for these different values so I kind of alluded to that but if you're going to be selecting the same values over and over again you can give it a nickname in Excel the way that you find that is under formulas you see the name manager here you can define names this way so um, let's see I will we have a few here um, I'll just show you an example of this. If I have these over here somewhere and I want to give them a named range or make them a named range, I can just select those, say defined it name, and give it the name. So the cool thing about named ranges, when you select the cells, the named range shows up here, but when I'm writing out those functions and formulas, I don't have to go and select those cells. I can just type in that nickname and it's going to reference those cells. All right, well, um, we did run out of time to go into more detail about index and match, but um, you know, I'll, I'll include some Microsoft uh, web pages that talk more about it. Uh, it's good to know just that it exists. Um, so let's see, I'll pause for questions at the very end. I wanna talk first, um, if you're interested in training, we do do department training. So if your group wants to learn more about VLOOKUP, more about these advanced formulas and functions, we can set that up for your department. Um, the best way, you can either email us at training at ku.edu or we have a request form on the technology.ku.edu website. Um, we also have all of our instructor-led workshops. We offer at least one a month on advanced formulas and functions. You can find those at workshops.ku.edu. And if you have a specific problem you're trying to solve, sometimes a Deside coaching uh, session is the best. You can request one of those, again, by filling out that form on our website. 
We do have those, uh, I didn't take out the one today, but we have additional sessions coming up for um, in the fall. You can sign up for those all at workshops.ku.edu. Um, so let me, uh, for anyone who needs to leave, you're welcome to leave. I'll follow up with those different resources I mentioned, a link to the recording, that type of thing. Um, I would like it, uh, I'll stick around. If you have any questions, um, feel free to submit them in the chat and I'll just stick around and answer any of those questions as they come up.